Well, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to speak here because I've read many papers of many people with, among the audience uh, since I was growing up. Uh, okay, so today I'll talk about uh, some uh, 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 recent attempt we have on uh, solving high dimensional PDs with tensor network and convex optimization. Right, so today's, today's talk will be focusing on first a uh, generative model uh, or density estimation technique with tensor network. Then uh, the second part of the talk will be concerning applying the first part of the talk to solving uh, 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 PDEs with uh, uh, tensor network and in combination with Monte Carlo method. The third part of the talk will be concerning some initialization procedure for uh, time evolution uh, techniques when solving PDEs. All right, so uh, before moving on, I will first introduce uh, uh, tensor diagrams. And I've seen, uh, so yeah, yesterday many talks has already introduced this and I'll just try to introduce it a little bit uh, more formally because I will do a lot of operations in terms of tensor diagrams. The basic objects are the following, right? Let's say you have a single variable function. You can think about it as a vector. So you're gonna draw it by one node and one leg coming out. If you have a three variable function, you can think about it as a three tensor, then you have a node and three legs coming out. And if you have a D tensor or a D variable function, you have D legs, okay? Now, uh, tensor contraction will be depicted as the following. So say you have two, uh, functions, f1 and f2. One is a three variable function, one is a two variable function. Let's just say you want to sum up the uh, x3 index, okay. What you do is the following. You take f1, has having three legs, right, because it's a three variable function, and f2, you're gonna join them at x3, right? You take the, the, the third leg and join them together. That means you're doing a contraction. Uh, and the results of the contraction is that you merge these two nodes and it becomes one, right? And you're left with a three variable function with Index, indices x1, x2, and x4, okay? So, right. are you saying anything about the, so these are finite dimensional vector spaces and you're, you're summing over basis? Yes, uh, uh, largely I'll think about it that way, uh, but then uh, you can also think about it in an infinite dimensional way where you're doing integration instead of doing a summation. And so you have inner product on these spaces? Uh, yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Uh, Are you working over reals, complexes? Uh, I don't define this uh, specifically, but yes, any because field. any field, yeah. Okay. Uh, later, I'm going to work with quantum mechanical wave function, and at that point, I'm going to use uh, a, a complex uh, field. Okay. All right, so uh, the simplest tensor network is really just a low rank two variable function. So fx1, x2 is coming from, let's say, the contraction of two nodes, g1 and g2, right? g1 and g2 are smaller size stuff, right? These are, so fx1, x2, these are n by n matrix, you can think about it that way, right? If you have, a, let's say, appropriate discretized two variable function. And then g1 and g2, these are size o little n object instead of size o little n square. And you save some storage complexity by doing it this way. Then, uh, uh, well, uh, the kind of like the direct generalization would be kind of like a simple tensor network for representing a D variable function. Again, uh, uh, in this talk, I'll mainly think about a function f as a discrete, as a function on the discrete space where you have D dimension, right? Each of the dimension has n state, okay? Now, the simplest generalization would be like, say, a matrix product state uh, introduced by uh, Steve uh, in the audience, and uh, recent, more recently is called a tensor train, okay. Now, uh, in terms of tensor diagram, it, it looks like the following. You have a chain of tensor nodes joined together, and there are D exposed legs, so uh, it's a D variable function. Now, uh, in mathematical terms, it's written in this way, right? It, when you want to evaluate F at a set of indices, X1 to XD, you take a bunch of matrices, multiply them together, and that will give you one evaluation. <coughs> now the storage complexity of this is, uh, is uh, linear in the dimensionality, uh, since you have D number of nodes, and 
if you have functions in this uh, representation, you can have all sorts of fast operations, taking inner product, addition, pointwise multiplication of function in OD complexity. Okay. Okay, so uh, the crucial question is, in order to uh, unleash this type of uh, fast operations that you can do with uh, tensor network, you need to first obtain this function f as a low rank MPS. Okay. Uh, the literature uh, largely uh, 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 approached this issue right, uh, through these uh, following uh, uh, angles. Right? You commit some simple observations of the function f, and then based on these simple observations, you compress f. Okay? Well, uh, for example, right, uh, 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 a very classic one is you do some sparse sensing of uh, the, the, this discrete function f. Right? You sample some entries of it, and then you, based on these entries, you try to complete the entire uh, tensor in terms of its components. So in the case of having a low rank matrix, this is really just kind of like the matrix completion problem. Uh, well, uh, another type of uh, uh, modality, that it, meaning another type of input is that you are given some high rank MPS. Okay? So this usually occurs in some iterative procedure uh, where the rank kind of grows and then you won't need to truncate it at some point. Okay? So this is uh, the, uh, another type of uh, uh, input modality. Or f is um, sum of like some simple functions, right? For example, just sum of single variable functions, sum of two variable functions, so on and so forth. Uh, or the worst case is you really need to have the full observation of the function, and then you just run SVD-like procedure to compress it. So so far, all of these methods are based on certain type of SVD uh, or randomized linear algebra technique, right? Uh, to compress the function. F. Where does the randomness come in? So a lot of this compression, for example, when you do SVD, you can replace SVD by a randomized SVD. Or when you do, for example, when you do sparse sensing of the entries F, you do some type of uh, cross approximation, which is kind of like another version of a randomized SVD with a different sensing mechanism. Excuse my ignorance. So how does randomized SVD work? Uh, actually, I'll have one slide uh, talking about randomized SVD, or a version of randomized SVD very, very soon, yeah. Okay, uh, so roughly speaking, how it works is the uh, following. You want to estimate the range of a, if you have a low rank matrix, you don't need to get the whole matrix, you just kind of like need to estimate the range of the matrix. And there's this procedure called range finding, and it, com it is consisting of taking a uh, matrix and then just right multiply the matrix by some a set of vectors. And that would somehow produce you an estimate of the range. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, in this, uh, it, but in all of this work, uh, basically they consider a setting where the input function f has no variance. It's a deterministic, deterministic function, okay? And you try to come up with better and better compression scheme to preserve the property of the function, L2 property of the function in particular. Okay, so in our setting today, we are going to be dealing with a, more like a data science setting, right? Uh, the application is generative modeling or density estimation, okay? Uh, here you are given samples Y1 to Y big N, right, which is distributed ID according to some underlying density P star. That means you have some empirical density hat P coming from some of direct deltas supported on yi, okay? The goal is to get an MPS approximation p from happy, right, from this sample happy, such that p approximately equals to the underlying true uh, density p star. If you retrieve a rank one MPS, that means you retrieve some type of uh, approximation to your underlying true density p star, or if it's low rank, you can roughly think about it as weakly correlated. Uh, so in this uh, case, what I want to emphasize is that the data is random. In particular, if you have a different set of samples, a different set of n samples, your input is going to be entirely different from another realization. Okay? So essentially what I mean is the following. In the previous setting, the variance of the input has not been taken into account. But in this setting, we actually need to appropriately take into account uh, of the variance of the data. 
Before moving on, uh, let me first point out why do we want P as an MPS for generative modeling? Because there are many other alternatives. There are normalizing flows, graphical models, stable diffusion, and many, many others, right? There are a few benefits for having MPS as generative models for scientific computing tasks. First, it can be stored with OD complexity. This is something that we talk about. Second, uh, it can generate IID samples with OD complexity. Uh, what I mean is the following, right? Say, right, in this type of task, right, for example, you want to generate images and stuff like that. <coughs> With some density, px, right, you want to generate like IID samples, right? You want the samples to kind of mimic the distribution. A way to do it, actually kind of like, almost like the best way to do it is the following. So px, right, any density, uh, emit this type of decomposition. So px1, and then you have conditionals of x2 on x1, conditionals of x3 on x2 and x1, and any probability density has this type of decomposition into conditionals. That means you can, if you have such type of decomposition, you can perform conditional sampling. What you do is the following. You sample x1, you fix x1, you sample x2, you fix x2, x1, you sample x3. And in OD complexity, you get an ID uh, sample. However, the difficulty is how do we get these conditionals? Because if I look at this conditional of the k variable on 1 to k minus 1 variables, okay, it comes from dividing the marginal from 1 to k by the marginal from 1 to k minus 1. And to compute marginals, it requires doing some high dimensional integration, uh, which is by no means trivial. But if you have p as an MPS represented object, you can actually do this marginalization with OD complexity. Furthermore, you can compute these moments algebraically, like the moments of this density p with OD complexity, which is uh, very useful in many scientific computing tasks because computing moments is kind of like taking inner product, right? And then taking inner product is easy. Then the last question is, can we estimate P star as an MPS with OD complexity, okay? P star is the underlying true, so, I have a, so there are three objects here, okay? Hat P is the empirical distribution. P star is what gives you the empirical distribution. That's the underlying true density. And P is what we, is the MPS represented uh, distribution that we want to use it as an approximate for P star, okay? Do, do you have any certification theorems like that your approximation is reasonable or so what circumstances are you guaranteed to have something like that? You mean whether, whether uh, underlying density P star can be approximated by MPS? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there, yeah, there are many experts in the room. So for example, uh, like in 1D Ising model, like uh, if you have a short range interaction, that's something that you can uh, approximate by uh, matrix product state. Uh, so basically it's uh, based on establishing, uh, in 1D, for 1D system, decay of correlation and having an MPS representation, these are if and only if. Uh, it's a 2014 results, uh, Brandao and Horodeki. Yeah. Uh, and then for more general cases, I don't think I have an answer, like what is the set of uh, wave function or probability density that can be characterized by uh, 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 MPS. Yeah. But there are, there are, there are a few, like uh, I'll show you one or two that is trivially true. But more generally. But you'll find out right away if it works. That's true. You can check uh, the singular value. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, right. So, our question is whether, right, we can, so we're given happy, right? We're given happy. Whether we can retrieve a P, right, as an MPS that approximate p star, okay? That is our question. And we want to do it fast, okay? Okay, so uh, let us start with a, a matrix example, okay? In this case, we really just want to estimate a two variable low rank density. Uh, so again, these are the objects. Hat p is of size n by n, p star is also size n by n. I think about it as a 
discrete probability density, but everything I said would have a continuous analog in our paper. And then uh, P star is uh, rank R. What we want to do is we want to estimate P star from uh, happy. Happy in this case is going to be a count matrix. And each entry will be like a Bernoulli distribution with mean being P star xi xj. Sorry, what's a count matrix? So basically what you do is that you draw some samples right from, the, uh, from this distribution. It's supported uh, on some of the entries on this n by n grid. And then you just tabulate how many times it falls into that particular bin. And then that will give you a kind of like a count matrix. So where, where each, uh, each entry of hat P uh, is tabulating how many times your sample drop into that bin. Yeah. So uh, in this case, right, if you think about it, each entry will have some Bernoulli distribution. Right? It has certain probability of uh, being dropped into that bin. And uh, the Bernoulli distribution has mean P star xi xj. Right? That's the probability of Wait, something. I don't quite understand the yes. bins. Uh -huh. Can you give a little more detail? Sure. Uh, you think about this n by n matrix, right? Uh, 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 like as like you having n square bits, right? And then each of the samples that you uh, that you have will fall into one of these bins with certain probability. And the probability it drops into that particular bin, like the bin i j, is this much. I, so the dimensions of your bins is that, I mean. If I, right. you're trying to reproduce a matrix. That's right. So the matrix is, you know, the number mm -hmm. of entries and how much you discretize it. Yeah. It's a huge space. So. That's right. So n by n is my state space. You can think about it that way. Yeah. And I have some, I'm drawing some samples from that state space. And each of the state is happening with this much probability, p star x i x j. So the number of times I'm going to see some event occurring at the ij entry is this much. With that. So practically, it's always zero or one. That's right. Okay. Exactly. That's actually uh, the the main difficulty of the problem. Practically, it's always zero. Actually, <laughs> it's always zero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 yeah, yeah. You well, you call out the story actually. Okay. All right. So, 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 happy is basically a count matrix, and the and each entry has this mean, right? P star x i x j. And the variance is also proportional to, to the probability, right? Because it, yeah, it's a Bernoulli uh, distribution per entry, OK? So here, I want to emphasize that this is not just a matrix completion problem, because you do not just observe an incomplete p star x i x j. Uh, what I mean is the following. Here, I'm generating a 5 by 5 rank 1 underlying true density p star. And this is how it looks like, OK? And I generate. 25 samples, and I tabulate them uh, in happy, okay? And this is how happy looks like. Of course, uh, as Steve points out, there are many, many zeros, okay? Even the places that is non-zero, for example, this 2-2 entry, it looks entirely different from above, which it should, because uh, these events don't happen very often. Uh, so if you like to think about it as matrix completion, you can think about it as matrix completion with a lot of noise, okay? Right, a lot of zeros and a lot of noise, okay? All right, so uh, let's, uh, uh, well, push this uh, uh, analogy further to see how, to, to get a feeling of the difficulty of the problem. So what you would be inclined to do if you think about it as a matrix completion problem, you're gonna say the following, okay? Say, happy, is some approximation to P star. You think about your histogram, right? Your count matrix as some approximation to P star. And in the worst case, this is kind of like the error that you can get. Big N is the number of samples. Little n is the number of states uh, per dimension. So you have little n square number of states. So this type of consistency result is really saying, in order for your histogram or count matrix to be a good approximation to P star, you need number of samples to be proportional to the uh, size of your state space, which totally makes sense, right? You have to at least visit each state once in order to get a sense. Uh, so then let's say we do singular value thresholding, okay? That, which is kind of like one of the most classical algorithm for matrix completion. What you do is you take happy, you perform an SVD, and you do a rank R truncation, right? And then you use that as an estimator, P. So P is your estimator to P star. 
if you work out the matrix perturbation bound, you're going to see that, again, you actually need this many number of samples. Because if your input has that much error, your matrix perturbation could have that much error. Okay. Uh, and, and so that means like, you need number of samples being a little n square to have certain sort of consistency right, coming from a sing singular value thresholding uh, estimator. Okay? So the question is, can we do better? right? Because you ought to feel like we can do better because we have a low rank matrix. We don't even have that many parameters. How, why do we need uh, uh, so many samples? Right? So maybe an attempt is to do a maximum likelihood estimation uh, with basically you're minimizing the chaos divergence between your sampling distribution with respect to some uh, low rank matrix ansatz, okay? And you restrict the space of P. So this runs into the case of a non-convex uh, uh, optimization. So Xun, actually, um, one of my collaborator, uh, he's now at Stanford, uh, he's sitting here, uh, he actually ran a lot of experiment with, 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 with this minimization, and he can tell you guys that uh, there's just, it's, it's not the type of minimization that is very benign. It always converges. It's the type that you always get stuck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 it has to do with like, taking the log in KL divergence and uh, this type of thing. So, uh, okay, here's a different idea. Okay, randomized linear algebra. Say we take. Uh, happy and integrate against something, okay? Right, for example, right, think about the case of the rank one, uh, rank one density, okay? If you have a rank one density, that means you have an uncorrelated density. How are you are gonna estimate the density? You're just gonna calculate its one marginal, and that suffices to characterize the density, okay? So I'm gonna take my P star, and I right multiply by one. Basically, I integrate out one of the variable, right? I integrate out the right variable, and this is what I get, and I take my empirical distribution happy and write multiply by one. And this is what I get. Just by eyeball norm, you already feel like these two are way closer to each other than these two. Okay, so this is the case for a rank one density. For uncorrelated density, you can use the marginal to estimate the matrix, the, the, the full matrix. But what about rank two, rank three, rank four, right? We need some generalization. And turns out there is a nice connection between this marginalization procedure with uh, randomized linear algebra. Okay. Right, any questions so far? Matthias? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just one short question about your remark on why you expect better if you just sample. I mean, there's an inherent difference between the matrix that is all one and the matrix with one, one, and everything at zero, right? They are both rank one. Uh -huh. The one you can, you can get a good idea of is fewer samples than for the other, right? So, yeah, so basically, it's true that uh, the number of samples you need might depend on the kind of like the smoothness, right, of the underlying density and so on and so forth, and, uh, uh, and that is true. But in general, like, let me just bring out this example again, right? Uh, if you have a rank one density, uncorrelated density, you just need to estimate the one marginal, right? And one marginal has one less dimension than two marginal. Right, and you expect a better rate in terms of estimation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, you might expect a 1D rate, for example. Of course, the 1D function can be very ugly, it's, it's true, but then it's not like the 2D function is less ugly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so, uh, 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 right. So now let's push this idea of multiplying your matrix against something further. And that actually enters the realm of randomized linear algebra. So it kind of like the center piece idea of randomized linear algebra is if P star is a lowering matrix or lowish rank, you actually can pull out the range of P star by the following operation. You take your P star, right, which is an M by M matrix, right multiply by a sketch T of size M by R. And turns out, uh, if you pick the range of these two guy, and they are in general very similar, or in the case of lowering matrix, they will be equal to each other. Okay. What's a sketch? So sketch is just a generously, generously chosen. Well, let's just say some choice of matrix that, and the choice is quite generous. Yeah. What does generous refer to? Generous. Okay. 
Yeah. Get there is. is. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so I'm gonna say something that uh, that what people do and what people generally do. So there are there are a few. Okay. One is you randomize t according to uh, Gaussian uh, distribution. Right. Just draw Gaussian random variables to tabulate your t, or rather mark a random variable plus minus one, or uh, or people do this like some mix of Fourier transform plus uh, some plus something. Okay, random Fourier transform. You can think about it that way. When you say generous, do you mean it has a in which way? I mean, I don't understand it from the example. So you, you might, have, especially large fluctuations, especially large entries. Is it especially big? What's generous about it? Oh, generous about it is that you might think I need to choose it in a very, uh, very careful way. But it turns out uh, it doesn't have to be that careful. Okay, that's that's what I mean by generous. What? Carelessly chose. Carelessly chose, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, all I want to say is like the choice, yeah, the possible, yeah, that's right. Carelessly chosen, okay, that's a better word. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so, uh, uh, okay, so if you agree, well, and if you accept uh, this, the first line, what you can do is the following. Suppose I want to obtain a lower rank decomposition, right? G1 star, G2 star of P star, right? This is, these are the left lower rank factors and right lower rank factors. What you can do is that you let G1 star to be P star T, right? Because P star T, you agree that it's the range of the matrix. So you're just gonna let the left lower rank factor be the range, right? And then to get the, uh, the second lower rank factor G2 star, what you do is you think about G1 star as a basis, G2 star as a coefficient, and you use this basis coefficient pair to span your full matrix P star, okay? And then you solve for, once you get G1 star fixed, you solve for G2 star and you're done, okay? And I rewrite this equation in a different manner. So what I, take, what I do is I'll take this like P star times T and move it to the left-hand side of the second equation, okay? Just reshuffle uh, things. Basically, all in all is saying that if you solve these two independent uh, uh, set of equations and then you're gonna get the low rank factors G1 star, G2 star, okay? Now, the second equation is still a little bit uh, wasteful because if you think about G2 star, it is of size R by N, but the number of equations over here, they're N equations, okay? So it's a little bit wasteful to solve for R variables, but uh, you're using N equations. So what people do is people supplement this second equation with a second sketch, they take S, right, which is of size M by R, and multiply S transpose on both sides of the second equation. That will reduce the number of equations from little n to R, okay? That is something, there are many names, uh, interpolative decomposition, Nistrom method, and yeah, for, for this type of technique. And then you solve for G1 star and G2 star. Now, finally, if you just have an empirical distribution happy, you just replace P star with happy as an estimate, and you solve this uh, equation. Mm -hmm. What I want to emphasize is that every object that is occurring in this equation, the size is bounded by O little n, okay? For example, P hat T, right? This is a n by R matrix, right? So these guys are just size O little n objects. And you, you'd imagine if you want to solve for G1 and G2, all you need to do is to estimate this O little n object, and you don't need that many samples, okay? So that is the story. And in this case, you can get by with a lower sample complexity. Okay, yes? There's no orthogonalization of, of anything here? Say that again? There's no orthogonalization of anything? There's no orthogonalization here, okay. I'm just gonna solve it this way. And uh, this will give rise to actually the Nistrom approximation with a sketch that is not just a direct delta type sketch, yeah. I think it's called generalized Nistrom recently, yeah. But you can authorize it, 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 it yeah. Uh, okay, so before moving to the high, higher dimensional case, uh, let me show some results first, okay. Uh, so, like I said, like uh, later I'm gonna talk about how to generalize it to D dimension, but first I'm gonna show the results comparing the SVD type procedure and our method, okay? Here I'm looking at a uniform distribution, P star. Uh, so it's totally uncorrelated. It's a uniform distribution on the unit cube of 
in the d-dimensional space, and the rank is one. And the number of sample size is 10,000, okay. I fix the sample size, and I'm changing the dimension, and I'm plotting the relative <coughs> calculus error. As you can see, you see this exponential blow up if you do an SVD type procedure. And if you do our procedure, you see this almost uh, no growth in the error, okay. So, and this exponential blow up is again a manifestation that if you want to get a consistent uh, M empirical distribution with the true distribution, you do need exponential number of samples, okay. And SVD type procedure, or the typical type of randomized SVD type procedure, will preserve all those L2 error, because these are L2 preserving type operations, okay. All right, so uh, let's uh, think about how to uh, uh, move to the high dimensional case. So I'm gonna use the tensor uh, diagrams in order to do the operations. Here, circle means uh, some coefficient that are fixed and known. Square means some unknown coefficient, well, unknown parameters that you want to estimate. So in particular, that interpolative decomposition that I show you can be written in tensor diagram as the following. You have this G1, which is a square node. You identify it with hep P, right multiplied by sketch T, okay? So here, to get G1, I contract out X2, right? I isolate you X1 and I contract out X2. Now I take this, I move it to the left hand side of the second equation and I supplement it with a sketch S to reduce the number of equations. So that is the, the philosophy. Now, uh, how to do the high dimensional case? So let's look at this uh, four dimensional uh, distribution. So you're gonna have, try to reconstruct something G1, G2, G3, G4, okay? What you do is the following. Again, I take my G1, right? I think about it as my left lowering factor. So I'm gonna isolate X1 and I sketch out X2, X3, X4 with a sketch T1, okay? Now I think I group G1, G2 together and think about it as the together left lowering factor. And I'm gonna isolate, on the right hand side, I'll isolate X1 and X2 and sketch out X3, X4, okay? And I'll do the same thing for G1, G2, G3. And lastly, I'm just gonna let G1, G2, G3 times G4 equals to hep peak, right? And kind of like by tautology, if I can solve this set of equations, I do get an MPS representation of my underlying true density P star. Okay, now uh, uh, what I'll do is the following. I'll take this right-hand side and I move it to the left-hand side because I can do the substitution. So I'm gonna replace G1, G2 by this guy, G1, G2, G3 by this guy, okay? And I'll do this substitution, and it becomes, again, an independent set of equations. So just like before, you can count the number of equations. So this has one leg, this has two legs, this has three legs. It means the number of equations grows like, this is n, n squared, and q. Number of equations is growing, and it's growing exponentially fast. And what you do is you're gonna bring a different set of sketch, S1, S2, and S3, and reduce this exponential growth of dimensionality to a single leg, which means it's uh, something small, okay? Now, uh, the summary is the following, right? We have a, a parallel set of equations to determine G1 G, all the way to GD, and then all these coefficients, uh, matrices A hat and B hat, these are very small size objects, okay? So that is uh, the summary. And then usually this A hat, B hat, these are low order empirical moments of uh, of, uh, of the empirical distribution hep P. So in this way, to estimate this course G1 to GD is equivalent to estimating OD number of moments, okay? If I think about this N, R, S constant. So what kind of moments that I need to form, right? That's the question, right? I said something that, well, about you can choose the sketch carelessly, okay? In this uh, situation, when we're dealing with a situation where there are variants, you cannot be that careless, actually. You actually have to choose something in a little bit, uh, in a more careful way. You're gonna choose this type of cluster moments. So basically, we have these cluster functions, single variable, two variable, three variable functions, and we're gonna use this as sketch. Basically, we randomize within this space. And the reason is kind of obvious, right? Because this type of functions, if you want to calculate their moments, the sample complexity goes like little n to the power of cluster size. Cluster size is kind of like the number of variables involved in taking the moments, okay? 
So basically, are, are, these, a, are yeah. these adjacent clusters or what? Right? Oh, actually, yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, depending on the probabilistic model, it can be adjacent or non-adjacent. Uh, and the, in the model that I'll show you is, is a Markov model, so it will, uh, I'll use adjacent cluster. Okay. And if there's some decay in terms of the, the range of uh, interaction, then you're going to use something that is nearby, and that's enough. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, the computational complexity is explicitly is linear in D. So, and there's big N is basically the number of samples. So this complexity says that to calculate the moments, right, it's O N, right, because right, you need to sum over N samples. And then you need to do this D times, okay? Right, that's kind of like the computational complexity. And there are other generalizations. And yeah, there are like Shin, my collaborator Shin is here. And, and uh, we have a paper together, and he knows all the details. Yeah. OK. Uh, now, uh, so here's uh, some theoretical results. So in order to talk about theoretical results, we need a model, because we want to compare our, our reconstruction uh, against something. Okay. And the simplest case is a Markovian uh, density. In, the, in this case, your p star comes from a decomposition of some t two variable function where each of these two, where all these two variables are kind of like adjacent variables, x2, x1, x3, x2, so on and so forth. Like this is a Markovian uh, model. And for a Markovian density, you actually have a ground truth matrix product state representation. Uh, and in particular, this ground truth matrix product state representation can actually be obtained from the three marginals coming from three adjacent variables, like what Steve just pointed out. So for this type of a nearsighted uh, 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 density, uh, you kind of just need to create uh, uh, moments uh, from the variables that are kind of like close to each other in terms of their interaction. So uh, well, since AK and BK can be estimated from the three marginals, uh, that means uh, we can solve for GK, right? as a good approximation to GK star with this type of error. Uh, so the error is some constant that is dimensional independent divided by square root of n. And the reason is the following, because a hat, b hat comes from the three marginals. Three marginals, the dimensionality of the density is always three. So three doesn't depend on d. So, uh, so you have this type of error rate. Okay. So sorry, what, what's this norm? So this norm is a weird norm. Uh, uh, it's basically, Right, GK is a third order tensor, right? So basically, it's kind of like uh, the Frobenius norm of each slice and then taking the infinity norm along like the vertical direction, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a mix, kind of like a mixed norm, yeah. Uh, and then we have a theorem if we assemble everything together that the relative error between the true density and our estimated density is this much. So again, it has this Monte Carlo rate, one over square root of n, inherited from here. And this little d is just the error of assembling d pieces of items together. And you acquire, uh, accumulate a linear in d term, okay? Right, so let me show some simulation results to show how well it agrees with the rate that we uh, have uh, given. Now, uh, here I'm plotting the log relative error versus the number of uh, samples. Uh, so the red dotted line is the Monte Carlo error rate, and this is our error rate, and it goes like one over square root of n. Okay. Uh, and I must say this is one of the highlight of our method because it doesn't require the use of some non-convex optimization to get the estimator. So in a lot of uh, statistical uh, estimator, Although theory will predict it should have a Monte Carlo rate, but sometimes it gets stuck, right, when you're doing the optimization and you don't get all the, you don't get the type of error rate that it deserves, okay, because of uh, not converging in terms of optimization. Uh, well, here I'm showing the, actually, the relative error, not the log rel relative error, versus the dimensionality. So I'm fixing the sample size and I'm um, uh, plotting the error, and it has this kind of like linear growth, okay? All right, 
Uh, actually, uh, any question? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, do you allow elements of the MPS to be negative entries, or do you assume everything is positive? Yeah. So I, I allow them to be negative. Yeah. But so there are possibilities to be very spurious, like some. It's true. Here. It's true. Yeah. So. But as long as like the L, the in terms of like, like relative error is close enough, like you can expect them to be not very prominent. Yeah, and that will be the biggest difference between the hidden Markov model, right? Because yeah, uh, that's right. It, 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 graphical model with, but then that's right. they are all positive entries. Yeah, that's right. The, the yeah yeah I guess a like, graphical model is good in that sense, right? It's always positive, but again, yeah, that but that's exactly that, that, that the manifold of convex. Uh, the, yeah. Optimization, yeah. positive condition, may in, uh, inhibit optimization. Exactly. That that is actually making things hard. Yeah. Especially all these uh, when you use entropy and stuff like that, things can become ill-conditioned and uh, and there, yeah. There is no such yeah. Uh, right. Here. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, depending on what you want. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you want to have easy linear algebra operations, then yes, you have to sacrifice something. <laughs> yeah. Basically, you need something in the L two space. Yeah. Instead of L1. Okay, right. So, uh, okay, so let's uh, uh, try to apply this type of uh, data science type like uh, idea or like method in uh, physics or PD applications. So often we need to solve this type of like time uh, evolving system in physics or PD, where H is some operator, psi is some set. Okay, for example, like uh, the quantum ground state problem, right? So H is a Hamiltonian. And if you bring t to infinity and you let psi, this set, to be the set of uh, norm one vectors, you're going to be solving this uh, uh, Rayleigh quotient uh, minimization uh, problem and you can retrieve the quantum ground state. Or another example is the Fokker Planck, where you have some operator H that is of this form. There's a diffusion term plus some transport term uh, initiated by a uh, uh, potential U. And psi is the space of density. Okay. Yeah, of course. Like, uh, I'm not enforcing non-negativity here, okay, which is a good point. Uh, then, uh, to solve this type of equation, you need to do this type of imaginary time evolution fast, right? And it's not always easy to have a low rank representation of this uh, type of uh, operator. Sometimes it's just pretty expensive to apply this as an MPO to the MPS. So, for example, right, the easy case are when H is lying on some 1D uh, uh, coming from coupling, like coupling of like you have these uh, pairwise operators lying on a 1D lattice. Uh, if you have some pairwise operators coming from, say, 2D lattice or just like more general interactions, it can be very expensive to apply this type of uh, uh, operators. And what we propose is a general strategy that might uh, alleviate the computational uh, overhead is the following. Say you have some guess of the solution at time t as an MPS. You apply this operator not in the form of an MPO, but you apply it in terms of some Monte Carlo method. Okay. Now you get some empirical, kind of like empirical density estimate of the application of the semigroup. Then afterwards, you take this and you sketch it. Right? You apply the aforementioned sketching method you compute the moments and all these things, and then you re reconstruct your uh, matrix product state representation. So pictorially uh, speaking, right, it, it looks like the following. So you run some particle dynamics or Monte Carlo simulation, and you sketch it, project it down, and you run further, you project it down, and you run further, you project it down. Okay. Okay. So uh, so we are running some. So I'm just showing some simulations uh, for let's say the transverse field Ising model. Say H right, is a Hamiltonian that's living on a lattice, right? So you have some coupling between the spin Z directions where IJ, like the coupling comes from the lattice. And then you have some uh, X direction uh, uh, magnetic field. And all of these operators are pretty big, okay. Now, uh, so I'm running uh, experiments on some small-ish uh, examples compared to what we have seen yesterday, like a couple of thousands of sites. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I have like this 32 periodic 1D Ising model, 4 by 4 periodic 2D. We can run larger uh, experiments. It's just like for this like a 4 by 4 2D periodic 2D Ising model, 
we are computing some ground truth uh, solution by direct diagonalization. So, so, right, we have done like something like 64 and 128. And then, uh, uh, but okay, what I want to show you is the convergence plot that we get. So what we, so basically we, we alternate sketching with some quantum Monte Carlo method and we get this type of a convergence plot. And as you can see, the convergence plot is pretty smooth. Uh, it's not something that you typically see in a quantum, quantum Monte Carlo uh, experiment where you need to take average over a few iterations in order to get like a smooth looking uh, energy uh, descending curve. Sorry? Yeah. What, what value of H do you use? H? Yes. At the phase transition point. Okay. Yeah. And, and why do you expect sketching to work here? Because I mean, like, yes. it's not a like, low rank object anymore or something. It's, not a... it's actually, we found even at the phase transition point, the rank is, doesn't need to be too high to give a good uh, energy approximation. It's, it's an easy one. Right? It's a, yeah, like, like, like what we saw yesterday, right? Like uh, the TFI model, like we speculate the correlation is not that strong. Yeah. And you're still reconstructing the FPS from just three sides margin? No, no, I, I do something uh, more general. I actually pick multi, like, okay. like all to all type. Uh, just on a Markov yes, yes. causes anything. Right. It, yeah, it, I'm, not, I'm not doing it as the Markov model, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, and yeah, these are the type of uh, relative error that we're getting. So at the phase transition point, right, uh, like this uh, 64 side one deizing model, 10 to the minus three, okay, it's not great, but we're trying to improve uh, uh, upon it, okay. So what's, what's the one dimension of the MPS? The bond dimension. So actually, we pick a few uh, from like about around eight to around fifty, and for some reason the error is roughly the same. And then we're trying to understand. In, yeah. What I find puzzling, I would bet that at zero point two you get the Sapphira C and at one point eight the product state. That's true. Yeah, I agree with you. So why would you need any bond dimension to get that accuracy? So I'm talking about this one. Oh, that yeah. one. Okay. Yeah, H equals 1.0. That's all of them. Yeah, I'm talking about it's this. Not the 0.2, that's a product set, basically? Or? Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 yeah. It's, it's very well approximated by mean field. I agree. Yeah, that's why I'm showing that, because the number looks good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at the star, it looks less okay. good. <laughs> okay. Okay, then we have a Fokker Plan uh, example, right? So again, we have a, a potential U. Uh, these are coupling sites on a, a 2D lattice. Uh, and then you have a potential enforcing each site to roughly looks like plus minus one. And then you run this uh, for uh, uh example. And we're tracking how the density evolve over time. And this is, I'm showing uh, one marginals. For example, this is at the equilibrium, right? Once, when this dynamics has converged. The, the red curve is the, our MPS density. And the dotted curve is our equilibrium density. And this is our sample histogram. And then, yeah, they agree pretty well, okay? All right. So the last part is concerning uh, how to initialize. And I only have uh, five minutes left. Uh, so basically, to do this like, time evolving technique is uh, good to have a good initialization. It's always good, okay. Right, so uh, usually people want to use kind of like a mean field, right, to, to start. Uh, the, the, the time evolution. So, uh, okay, then the question is, how do you actually get the mean field? Okay. Of course, you can directly solve some nonlinear equation. Right? For example, like, let's take this example. H is a Fokker-Planck operator. Psi is a density. And then we want to obtain the stationary solution. H psi equals a zero, right? A standard way is to commit some type of a mean field approximation. For example, solving the stationary mekin bosov equation, right? What you do is the following. You take this equation, h psi equals to zero, and you integrate out all the variables but the i variable, okay? And what you're gonna get is this type of equation, right? You have some one side operator uh, up, like uh, applied to the one, the i marginal, and the sum of some two sides operator applied to the ij two marginals, okay? So what this is saying is the following, right? This, this term is actually kind of like the average uh, forces that uh, all other particles have on the i side, okay, right? So 
And what people do is the following, right? This side ij, right, big, because it's like the two marginal, and you apply some decorrelation approximation. You pull apart side ij into side times side, side j, and then you solve this equation, okay? So this is like the mckinn vossoff type uh, uh, equation when at stationary point. But the bad thing is it gives rise to a set of nonlinear equations, right? Because this is nonlinear. Now, how do we regain convexity? So, like I said, the typical way is to break this big high dimensional function into products of individual marginals, okay? And this gives rise to a non-convex problem. And what we do is we go in the reverse direction. Instead of restricting to a subset of the probability simplex, we construct an outer approximation to the probability simplex. How we do that is the following, right? We look at a certain weak formulation. Say psi is larger equal than zero, right? This is characterizing the probability simplex. What you do is you come up with some test function Q that is non-negative. You test it against psi, and you ask that psi is non-negative when tested against this Q, okay? So what kind of uh, uh, Q that we choose? So basically, we choose Q from square of some function, right, because to make it non-negative. And, and this function space S is, uh, is coming from uh, the span of the cluster basis. Again, I'm going to come up with like, like one cluster, two cluster basis, basically single variable or two variable basis. And I create a span uh, like a, of this basis to give me the space for S and I square it. And then this will give me my test function Q that is non-negative. I'm going to test it against psi. So all in all, uh, uh, if you run this, you're going to get a set of linear equations that looks like this. So you have a linear equation in terms of the one marginal psi and the two marginal psi ij, and then you have a set of convex constraints. Okay. And in the end of the day, all I want to say is this is a semi-definite programming uh, problem with size, with matrix of size n times d times n times d. n is the kind of like the number of discretization per per dimension, and d is the number of dimension. Okay, so this is this matrix. So, uh, well, I'm going to skip some theoretical results re regarding how well this works, and and actually uh, just acknowledge my collaborators and uh, my students. Thanks.